Hi, I am Shelby Bush, and I am co-founder and chairman of We the People AC Alliance. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to government transparency and accountability. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee for allowing us this opportunity to present. In September of 2022, just about four months ago, we were commissioned by former Senate President Karen Fan to do an overall analysis of the 2020 election and the 2022 election and how that relates to signature verification. We're looking at the whole process from beginning to end and how that process um, how the process itself really works and what flaws are necessary, what changes may be necessary to gap some flaws. So we started by getting access to 1.9 million ballot envelope signatures along with 5.3 corresponding voter registration files. Through that, we were able to learn a lot about the process, how it works, and how signature verification works. And that, we, and that was from what year, 2020 or 2022? So the voter ballot envelopes were from 2020, and the registrations were historical files all the way through March of 2021. Okay, thanks. Yes, and so we also studied the current regulations, the policy and procedure manual put forth by the Secretary of State and the current legislation involving signature verification. So signature verification is a process by which you take the voter uh, ballot envelope and compare it to the affidavit in order to determine whether it's a legitimate vote. So there are two areas that we looked at that we want to share with you today. The first one is the signature verification of 2020 and how that relates to 2022. 420,987 ballot envelopes failed signature verification in the 2020 election. The system was never repaired, and because of that, those same issues that caused the massive amount of failures was still in existence in the 2020 election. In the 2022? In the 2022 election, which has left our system still vulnerable. The other area I want to cover is the tabulator machines. We received, just a few weeks ago, January of 2023, the system log files from the tabulators that were used in Maricopa County on election day, along with the redacted CVR records. Through an analysis, we were able to determine that a quarter of a million ballot feeds misread by those tabulators. There are approximately two tabulators in every polling center, which means there were 446 tabulators with a quarter of a million voter attempt failures. So when you say misread, you, you mean the ballot was put into the machine and then kicked back out? That is correct. Okay. So one more clarification in my mind. So if one person, say for example, put his ballot into the tabulator and it spit back out and then he reattempted it multiple times, we don't that number doesn't represent a number of people or a number of attempts, just the overall set of data points of how many times the machines kicked back a ballot. Madam Chair, that is correct. And, and, and the Madam ballot Chair, feeds. What happens to those ballots? They're not forgotten and lost, right? I mean, they go to a process to get counted eventually. Go ahead and finish and then answer that question. Sure. So the, the ballot feeds go, go through me and then address Senator oh. Mendez. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Mendez. So what happens to those ballots is not necessarily something that we have analyzed. The ballot will attempt to be read by the tabulator and then be sent from there to potentially MTEC or central count where at that time it may be adjudicated, it may be counted. We didn't follow the, the life cycle of the ballot. We're simply pointing out the fact that these tabulators failed at 235 times the Election Assistance Commission's regulated failure rates. Madam Chair, but so we're all acknowledging there is a process to take care of this potential situation? 
Uh, my understanding is we don't know what happens to the ballot because of this. Is that correct? Madam Chair, yes. There is no record that generates to tell us how that ballot or if that ballot was appropriately tabulated on site. So when you have this many ballots brought into question and this many ballots that are not being adequately fed in and tabulated on site, it creates um, a lot of question and doubt and voter confidence decreases. Okay, proceed. Uh, before we leave that point, Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Bush, who came up with the, could you go back one slide? Who determined the, the number 420,987 from the 2020 election? Was that your organization that determined there were that number of failed signatures, or was that the number reported by all of the counties in, in Arizona? So, Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, that number is based on a, a, um, a review of a quarter of the 1.9 million envelopes from the 2020 election. We used 150 trained workers that studied the Secretary of State manual and followed those guidelines. And then they analyzed each voter record individually. Once we got the statistics for that first 25% or 400,000 ballots, then it was extrapolated to determine the final number. Those are Maricopa County. And that is just Maricopa County. Yeah, that's the point I was going to make, Madam Chair, is I think Maricopa County alone uh, had 2,089,563 ballots in 2020, and one, about 1 1.9 million of them were by mail. And so your group analyzed about 25% of those 1.9 million in Maricopa County, came up with a percentage that you considered to have failed signature verification, then you extrapolated to get to the 420,000. Madam correct? Chair, Senator Bennett, that is correct. Thank you. Okay, proceed. So the first thing we did was decided to analyze the time it takes to actually do this adequately in order to determine whether or not some of these failures exist because the counties are understaffed or under-resourced and don't have the adequate ability to actually verify these signatures with quality. So we took the number of mail-in ballots in the 2022 general election that were received, which was approximately 1.3 million, and the number of workstations dedicated in Maricopa County to mail-in ballot signature verification at the first level. There's 28 workstations and two rooms, and 25 of those computers are fully dedicated to signature verification. Based on the shifts they work and the days that they were actually processing and verifying signatures, we used a mathematical equation to determine just based on the final 298,000 that came in on election day, they used two and a half days or two and a half shifts to verify those signatures. And if you break that down by the man hours used, the number of signature verifiers and the number of stations available, then they would need to verify a signature every eight seconds. We have used 150 trained workers who have been doing this since September and put in 470 combined work hours into signature verification and the average time it takes to adequately review a record is 30 to 45 seconds. Also, when we take the additional 1,013,734 and divide that over the 15 days necessary, they would need to maintain a consistent pace and have every computer field and would have to verify a signature one every 13 seconds. The math just doesn't add up to giving the county what they need to adequately do this job. Madam Chair, um, and Ms. Is it okay? Okay, I, quickly go. Okay. Uh, just having a question about the signature verification process. So we're 
uh, the 298,000 signatures that you're starting from, those are the ones that were first kicked back from the computers? Is that for, for oh, further? That's a different issue. Two different issues. Oh, from the... Yeah, we're, we're talking right. two issues no, today. No, no. Understood that tabulation okay. is one thing. This is signature ver right. verification. Right. Um, okay, but, uh, okay, so then my, 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 my question then is that it's my, so your, the numbers here, the calculations here are for the workstations. Um, is it possible there's verification done in alternate ways? For example, um, I believe Maricopa County uh, you know, doesn't conducts signature verification not just at the workstations, but also certified elections officials can also do the to that signature verification. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, I'm so sorry. Um, Sunderation. 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 I apologize. Sunderation. Sunderation. I apologize. So yes, there are managerial level employees that conduct signature verification at other workstations. Three of those are included in the 28. The additional ones are done in their offices or other areas, but those are second level and third level review. Those are full-time manager employees that do not conduct first level review. Thank you, proceed. I, I have a question, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, Madam Chair, Shelby. When you say a day, was that an eight-hour shift or longer? Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, it's a actually a 10.5-hour day. They have two shifts. One is eight-hour and one is four hours long. But we also took away the one-hour lunch break that was reported by all of the employees and the 15-minute breaks. And the 10 to 15 minutes, they said, it took to shift change, okay. which left us with quality work hours of 10 and, ten and, a, half and a half per day. 10 and a half hours in, per the two and a half days. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. So the next slide you will see is an exhibit in your packet. I refer to that as exhibit three. This is just an overall assessment of our findings when we evaluated our 380,976 ballots at the beginning of this process. And this will just give you a breakdown of the various types of issues that we located, the violations that we found, the statute it violates, and the number. I will go into each of these in further detail, but I want to give you this chart for reference. Thank you. So the first violation we found was blank envelopes. The statute is very clear that a blank envelope has no ability to be cured. A signature must be rendered on that envelope by 7 p.m. on election day. However, we found 1,870 ballots that were cured against this particular statute. The first example you'll see here it's blank with no signature. It also does not include a phone number. Not only was this ballot cured and stamped verified without a signature, it was done so in a five-day curing period, which was 11-8, five days after the statutory expiration. The next one was received on election day, November... Madam Chair, to that point, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Ms. B uh, Ms. Bush, you're saying that you believe it was cured after the five-day period? Madam Chair, uh, Senator Bennett, yes, we have the metadata for these envelopes that tell us the date of any adaptations, changes, or curing. It will give us the date and time that, uh, that that envelope was scanned back into the system as repaired or cured. And this one was metadata stamped as being cured on November 8th. And the election, Madam Chair, Senator, uh, Ms. Bush, election was on what day? November 3rd. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe the statute allows for five working days, and that excludes the Saturday, Sunday, and in this election in 2022, Monday was a holiday. So did you account for the business days, five days? Because I, I believe that the election was on Tuesday. They had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, would have been the third day. Saturday, Sunday, and a holiday on Monday would not be included. 
and therefore Tuesday and Wednesday of the following week would have been allowed. So I thought that went to like November 10th or something. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, the difference in this, and, and yes, you're absolutely correct, November 8th was well within the curing period. Right. The problem with this is blank envelopes are clearly stated in statute and also in the policy and procedure manual to not be subjected to a five-day curing period. They must be resolved by 7 p.m. on election day. Okay, I, that I agree with, but um, I thought you were saying that you found some of these ballots cured on November 8th which was not within the five-day period. What, what I think you're really saying is that in the case of unsigned signature boxes on envelopes, if it's unsigned as of 7 p.m. on election night, it's not curable in the first place. Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, that is correct. Okay, thank, thank, you. You. thank you for that clarification. This five yep. So as you'll see, there's a few more examples of the same scenario. Madam Chair, quick question. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair and uh, Mrs. Bush. Um, if there's no phone number on there, how does the county contact the voter to tell them to come in and, and verify? So, Madam Chair, Senator Borelli, normally the signature verification team would then need to lend to the voter record or the voter file, which would be their most recent voter registration record to pull those numbers. The unfortunate thing that we have found during this audit is that we actually have some accounts. None of those registrations have phone numbers. We also have reports from some of the signature verification team that worked in 2022 who said they had no numbers accessible to them when they were curing ballots. So it, it makes it more difficult, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the voter does not have a phone number available to the elections department. Go ahead. So again, this is just a third example of that same scenario. This ballot was received on November 3rd by the Elections Department and then was given a curing period and cured without a signature, which is again in violation of statute. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so uh, Madam Chair and Mrs. Bush, are we saying there's no other scenario where something like this would have happened? Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, uh, there is no reasonable explanation for it that falls within the law and statutes currently in the so state like, of Arizona. So, Madam Chair, Mrs. Bush, so somebody wouldn't have been mistakenly signed on a different part that just isn't included in this picture, and then that would have been resolved? Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, I suppose if the voter decided to sign on the other side of the envelope or somewhere in a tiny area with writing, that is a scenario that is possible, but the likelihood, in my opinion, that that could happen uh, almost 2,000 times, it doesn't appear to be likely. We have seen instances where voters will sign on the phone number line or even sign underneath or above the box, but for them to sign in an area outside of this scope that is available to the elections for auditing seems very unlikely. And if that scenario is happening this many times, you may want to look into it as a Senate body to, to actually quantify that area in scanning. Go ahead, Ms. Bush. So the next violation we found was signatures other than the voter. So these are not examples that you would deal with if you see a signature that just doesn't match. We can't clearly state that that's someone other than the voter. But in this first scenario, if you look at this example, this is a voter by the name of Manuel who has somebody other than Manuel signing his ballot. Now in this particular case, this is a household member who signed the ballot uh, probably accidentally. We can say maybe it's a husband and wife who signed ballots for one another. The problem with this scenario is that what we noticed was happening is the county was accepting these ballots as is and generating labels that they were placing over the name and voter information of the ballot envelope and changing it to match the signature, therefore altering that ballot record, that ballot affidavit envelope record, and it's also inconsistent with the writing on the affidavit that no one other than the voter themselves shall sign the envelope. Ma Ma Madam Chair, to the point. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and, and Mrs. Bush, um, I, I want to go back to the, to the example where you were showing 
places where they didn't sign. And, and I feel it was a little ingen ingenuous to just say, like, there's a problem because we found so many that, that don't have signatures. But there's all, uh, I'm, I'm talking with other people, and there's lots of examples why people wouldn't have a signature there. doesn't necessarily mean there's a fire. Uh, but uh, I've personally uh, serviced voters who can't sign for lots of different reasons. We'll get to that example. Let her finish the briefing. Okay, here is another example. This is actually the counterpart to the previous ballot. This is uh, the signer of the first ballot's ballot envelope signed by the voter who should have signed the other envelope. So this is clearly two household members that they modified the envelope to adapt for these two voters and allowed those ballots to be counted. A question, uh, putting a label on an affidavit envelope, uh, that has to be clearly a violation of statute, is it not? I mean, how does the county get to do that? Madam Chair, yes, we saw this in magnitude. I believe, if I can tell you, we have located in, in this quarter of a total overall assessment review 542 scenarios where this exists. And they print white mailing style labels with a typeset font and they put it over the top of the barcode and the voter information for the voter it belongs to and adapt it and modify it. And in my opinion, it appears to be a violation of law because it's alteration of an election ballot and also a, a ballot affidavit being signed by the wrong voter. Thank you. Ms. Madam Chair, you said it's a modification of the ballot. You meant the, the ballot, ballot envelope. 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 Okay, thank yes. you. Now here's an additional example of somebody signing other than the voter. We also found many times this happened where we could not find any correlation to it being a household member. And there were no modifications made to the ballot envelope and the vote was counted against the original voter. And you can see in this scenario, uh, Heather is the ballot affidavit owner. And if you look to the right, that is her voter record signature. However, the signature on that ballot envelope was passed through the system in first round without any challenge or curing process. Here's another example of a similar scenario where the name of the voter is Ida, and I guarantee you she does not have a middle name of Margaret, but Margaret signed the ballot envelope, and this passed through in round one first level verification with no challenge or curing. Now to Senator Mendez's concerns about voters who cannot sign their envelopes, the state of Arizona has this beautiful thing called the Special Elections Board. It's dictated under ARS 16, 547 and 549. This is a special election board that's designed by the state of Arizona that each county has to enact and it provides assistance to those voters who need help. They maybe can't sign the envelope or they've had a stroke. There's various reasons, but most of the time it's because they need assistance filling out their ballot or signing their name. And that is the Special Elections Board or SEB Board. We found 2,104 additional to the blanks that are potential SEBs. The problem is, is it states in statute that it needs to be signed off by an SCB witness and dated. And we found 2,104 of these scenarios we believe are SCB, but there's no way to validate them. In this slide, you'll see what we believe to be a correct SCB ballot. There's two side by side. And if you'll notice in the first one, there's an X made or a mark made. And above it, it says SCB team verified voter mark. That seems legitimate to me. Even without initials or dates, it's obvious that this voter got quality and appropriate assistance. If you look to the right, the same scenario is true. They wrote on there that they were unable to, to make a mark or sign their name, and SCB countersigned that as a witness. So these are, these are the system working at its finest. But what we found in these over 2,000 ballots were scenarios such as this, 
where there's an X mark in place of a signature with a clear signature voter record. However, nowhere is the signature countersigned or documented as being witnessed or approved by Special Elections Board. Madam Chair. Go ahead. A uh, qu quick question. So uh, again, on this slide, we see that blacked out section. And I wonder, uh, we, we had, there was a, a couple of slides before where there were the blacked out sections. Um, I'm wondering if, if the relevant information that might help answer those questions is, is under the blacked out section that's just being hidden to you know, protect personal identifying information? Madam Chair, Senator, to answer that question, that black box is there to cover the phone number. We do not want this presentation going public and any voters to be unduly um, harassed. At the pleasure of the chairman, I'm sure there would be a way we could arrange for you to view this unredacted as a senator to confirm what's under that box. So just to clarify, you, you redacted that area yourself. It didn't arrive to you read it. Madam Chair, Senator, yes. Here's an additional example of an SCB ballot. Uh, this one states unable to sign due to disability. The interesting thing about this one is again, it has no telephone number. There's no SCB countersigning or witnessing occurring on it. And it went through a curing process. And typically SCB ballots don't need to go through a curing process because the, the need for a signature is waived. So we have no way of knowing whether a relative or Somebody unbeknownst to the voter wrote this information and it passed through the system. Another violation we found is duplicate voters. As all of you are aware, it is illegal to vote more than once in a single election. And as a matter of fact, we have a state statute that points out that it is a class five felony to do so. We have already identified provably 128 scenarios of duplicate voters. And these voters were turned over to the attorney general's office. Here's one scenario where a voter voted on October 21st of 2020 and again on October 30th of 2020. Another scenario where you can see two different dates and the handwriting of the phone numbers are similar. I left a portion of that phone number unredacted just so you guys could see that it is consistent. Here's Madam another Chair. example. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Ms. Bush, did you validate somehow that two votes were counted for this one person? Um, or that one of them was rejected after the other one was counted? Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, yes, we did verify that through the data itself. Some of these duplicate voters actually had more than one voter ID, which is how it originally had slipped through the system, but they were the same voter and we verified that through private um, redacted information. And so we know for a fact both what's of those private, counted. Madam Chair, uh, what's, shall, Shelby, what's private redacted information? You verified that they counted two votes for one person through private redacted information. What does uh, that mean? Madam, Madam Chair? Chair, Senator Bennett, what I'm meaning to say is we were able to confirm that both of these voters are in fact the exact same voter by looking at PII information that we have access to, such as last four of social, driver's license number, and dates of birth. Madam Chair. So, Ma Madam Chair, um, are you talking about finding two voter registration documents for the same in individual that has the same information on both of them? Is that what you're referring to? Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, we found both of these, both of these ballot envelopes had a tabulation count for them. Both ballots were accepted by the Elections Department and tabulated into the system. Thank you. Madam Chair, question. Go ahead. Uh, Shelby. Shelby, I have a question for you. Um, if these ballots went through the cure process, do we know that if the voters were contacted to cure uh, two votes? Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, I don't believe no, you can cure Senator two Hernandez. votes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't believe you can cure two votes. The law makes it clear that you can only vote once in an election. 
So in that scenario, Madam Chair, follow up. Go ahead. So in that scenario, if the voter was contacted to discuss this, if they re received two votes, what is the process that happens there? Madam Chair and Senator Hernandez, I'm not sure that that should be a scenario. Uh, I don't think there's a policy in place for allowing two votes to count. It is actually uh, indicated that if the county becomes aware of a secondary vote, they are supposed to report it to authorities, not to the voter themselves. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Go ahead. So here's a few more examples of that same scenario. So here's an additional violation. Um, in addition to having issues with the actual ballot envelopes, we noticed some patterns that were a little bit concerning that we wanted to bring to your attention in regards to the actual registration itself. One of them is unreasonably mismatched voter registrations or wrong names on the voter registrations. We found 36,034 records so far in the voter registration files that have clearly different names, missing names, or inappropriate information connected to those files. We believe some of this is due to the digital signature implants from the Service Arizona system. Here's one example where the signature on the ballot envelope belongs to that voter, and that is a good countable ballot. However, the voter record has a voter registration with that same voter's private information and all of their current details, only with the signature of a completely different voter inserted onto that registration file. Here's a similar scenario where the voter on the ballot is absolutely legitimate and the signature is valid. However, there is a voter of a completely different, um, one is female and one is male, who signed one of the voter registrations. And we did confirm that those voter registrations actually contain the information of the voter and should have been signed by the voter. Sure. Go ahead, yes, Senator. Madam Chair. And, uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, ma Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Bush. So when you went to the voter registration form, the information on the voter registration form had the information of the individual that signed the affidavit, no. but just the signature is completely cut and pasted from what? Madam Chair, Senator Borelli, yes. So just for the sake of this, we will call voter the voter um, Doug Ship for DS. Okay, Doug Ship is on that voter registration form along with the appropriate phone numbers, addresses, dates of birth, and that is by all due rights his voter registration. However, the signature box has a signature of Jeff S. instead of DS. So, so Madam Chair, Ms. Bush, so what you're literally saying is obviously when they were doing the sick verify, they never even noticed that. They let it go through. Madam Chair, Senator Brelli, that is correct. Thank you. Here's another scenario and another scenario. And if you could see the unredacted portions, I think it would be helpful to you, but unfortunately we just, we have to protect voters, so we can't do that. But both of these voter signatures are independent, and the signature on that voter registration does not belong to the voter whose registration it is. Another violation we found was illegible and unusable references. We, saw, we found scenarios where addresses were updated, voter affiliation was updated, and various things were changed in the system, sometimes with no signature whatsoever on that voter registration file. We also saw significant flaws in the actual Service Arizona system itself. Because of the digitizer pads, sometimes these signatures are so microscopic you can't see them, and sometimes they're so depixelated 
period that it becomes just an ink blotch that you cannot read. We found 4,433 of these so far that we believe to be completely unusable. The other footnote I want to add is that at first level verification, the system that's set up at Maricopa County does not provide for zooming features. What you are going to see is actually a zoomed feature, but what they see at first level verification is the microscopic version. So here's the first illegible or unusable signature. As you can see, that signature is very, very small at the bottom. And because of the thickness of the digitizer, it's almost impossible to make out any fine details. That is zoomed in in comparison to what they would see in SigVerify. Here's an example of a voter registration that was processed that had no signature overlaid on it whatsoever. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Go ahead, Senator. Ms. Shelby. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Shelby, so for some of these uh, that you've identified here, um, you're, you're finding the kind of illegible, unusable signatures. My understanding of the, of the then cure process is counties will attempt to contact the voter. Voters have the opportunity to update their signatures that are then on file to be able to confirm. Does your analysis include those updated signatures? And Madam Chair, Senator, so these are some of the most recent signatures that are on file. Many of these are the most recent. The, the problem with the Service Arizona voter registrations, which is what we're predominantly dealing with, is they do not have a requirement for an updated signature. You can go into Service Arizona and change your voter registration 150 times over a course of 35 years, and the same signature will carry over from form to form to form. And oftentimes there are no other signature references available to you. We've even seen this scenario in cases where women get married and change their last name and they change their name with the DMV, but the old signature from 10 years prior with their maiden name is the signature carried over into the file. This is a significant issue that I hope the Senate will address. So another violation we found is signatures on the registrations are all different. So we understand that people's signatures change over a course of time, and sometimes that's very natural. But some of the examples we found were extraordinarily drastic, and I will show you what that looks like. So we found 48,117 voter records where we could not reconcile with any reasonable amount of perspective a signature simul similar to the other. And we do use the basic 12 point of verification provided by the Secretary of State. So here's an example, if you look to the right, there's two voter registration records on file for this particular voter. Neither of those signatures are even close to one another, and the ballot envelope that was approved in the first level without curing doesn't match either one of them. If the ballot, the ballot registration forms or the voter registration forms are this disconnected from one another, it makes signature verification an even more difficult task. Here's another scenario where you have three voter registration signatures on file for one voter. Each of them are very different from one another, and the ballot envelope signature is similar to one of the three signatures, but is still not exact. So this makes the voter registration file a little bit, dif a little bit difficult to decipher. Here's another scenario where you have very drastically different looking signatures. And again, we recognize that signatures change over a course of time, sometimes people shorthand, but there are certain tales as taught by the Secretary of State that you look for, such as left leaning slants, right leaning slants, where you start your pen, where you stop your pen. And those are the type of things that we really look for when we're identifying whether or not we consider it a match or a mismatch. Here's another example that includes three reference signatures. The first reference signature appears to be very similar to the second, but the third reference signature is extraordinarily different, and none of those representatives match the actual ballot envelope. 
Another scenario we found is signatures that do not match on election day. However, they were approved and sent through the system. And then later, a new registration was introduced that matches the signature from the ballot envelope. Here's an example. This person registered to vote on July 4th of 2020, just months before the election. The signature they used on the digital pad was very drastically different than the ballot they approved in November of 2020. However, on February 3rd of 2021, the digital signature was updated to a signature matching the ballot envelope. Here's another identical scenario where the signature on 521 of 2020 is drastically different from the ballot signature envelope that was passed through the system in 2020 but only later on February 3rd of 2021 was a new digital signature introduced that matched that voter signature. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Michelle, might, might that actually be an example of what we were just talking about is where the county contacts the voter to update their signature in order to match that and cure that ballot? Madam Chair, Senator, this may be one of those scenarios we did discover, and I will get into it in the next slide, some unusual patterns with this situation. The other thing is, is these signatures are coming in through Service Arizona, which is a Department of Motor Vehicles style registration. In order to update your signature, you would have to physically go to the DMV, and I would imagine if they were contacted by the Elections Department, they would choose to update their voter registration through the Elections Department and not the Motor Vehicle Department, but I cannot make those assumptions. So with this pattern, we saw some recognizable um, issues. We found very large numbers of new registrations being pushed into the system on January 28th, February 3rd, and February 8th that all meet the previous criteria of a signature update. 783 new registration changes meeting that criteria we found in February 3rd alone, along with hundreds on those other two dates. And uh, we have become aware of a third party URL access granted by the Secretary of State to allow some of these larger nonprofit organizations to register people to vote through the Service Arizona website. We will provide more information to that as, as it develops, so I will look forward to reporting more on that. But due to the fact that these are all digital signatures and appear to have no additional registration change. It does, in my opinion, raise some concern for additional looks. These are all scenarios where there was no address change, no phone number change, no party affiliation change. They were all just consistent with the signature update. Another violation that we found was signatures that failed to meet Secretary of State standards. Now these signatures by Secretary of State standards, in order to fall into this category, we tried to make sure that they were missing um, at least 50% of the points of match to call in this category. And we found 47,366 of this scenario. Here's one example. You could tell stylistically that these signatures could be similar. However, they failed 10 out of 12 points of signature verification. So that would be one failing standards. Here's another scenario. This is potentially the same signer, and it's not what we would consider an egregious or something we would, we would look at and say this could be a forgery. However, it fails multiple points of signature verification based on its lien, where the pen starts and stops, and various pen lift situations and letter sizing. Here's a third example, which is a little bit more drastically different. It's also what we would consider a Secretary of State failure, not necessarily egregious, where the signatures have some slight lean similarities, but stylistically it's entirely different. But what was most concerning to us overall was that 10% of the signatures reviewed fall into what we consider an egregious category. We trained all of the workers to make an attempt to pass a ballot, 
not to look for a reason to not pass the ballot. Everyone that fell into this egregious category, we believe, uh, has zero capability of meeting any of the Secretary of State standards. Here's one example of that. This is also representative of a pattern that we are processing and still investigating, and it is where there are two S's used in the signature box in place of a valid signature, oftentimes not even with S being part of the name. In this particular case, I believe there is an S in the first name. I'm going to flip through these just one at a time slowly for you to view. Now, Madam Chair, I would like to refer to some of the declarations of the 2022 signature verification workers that we interviewed. All of these statements I've provided to you in exhibit form, and they are uh, sworn declarations. Okay, go through those quickly if you would. So the first one I'd like to cite is exhibit one Declaration of Andrew Myers, and that would be page four, paragraph 21. In my room, we had a whiteboard that Michelle would update with numbers of ballots to be verified that day. Throughout the day, Michelle would update the progress the people were making in verifying signatures. The math never added up. Typically, we were processing about 60,000 signatures a day. I would hear that people were rejecting 20 to 30 percent, which means I would expect to see 12,000 to 15,000 ballots in my pile for curing the next day. However, I would consistently see every morning only about 1,000 envelopes to be cured. We typically saw about one-tenth of the rejected ballots we were told we would see. In Andy's declaration, he notes that the rejection rates were consistent with our findings at 20 to 30 percent. But he also noted that the math just didn't seem to add up. He was only seeing 1,000 envelopes per day at that next level of the curing process for review, even though the math said he should have received 12,000 or more the following day. Now, Madam Chair and Distinguished Committee, I would like to refer you to Exhibit 2, the Declaration of Jacqueline Onekite. On page 2, paragraph 11 through 13. At times when the workload was high, Level 2 and 3 managers sent some of their work, which was to review our Level 1 work, back to Level 1 again to re-review the work we had already done. There were observers watching the review of level one, but there were not any observers watching all of the review levels two and three. Sometimes the observers were able to watch some of the work of Andrew, a level two manager, but were not able to observe any of the work of the other level two managers, Jeff and William. After the above signature review, the approved signature ballots were counted and the rejected signature ballots were sent into a process whereby the ballots could be cured. In this declaration, Jacqueline points out that not only were level one review workers being tasked with reviewing other level one reviewers' work, but according to Andrew's declaration on page two, paragraph nine, the level one workers were being asked to re-review and override the decisions made of level two and three workers that rejected ballots. They were more skilled and had more access to voter registration files, and when those ballots were rejected, instead of sending them into curing, as would be the process, they would send them back to a temporary, unskilled uh, not as well trained employee to try and see if they could get it to pass. Madam Chair, to this point. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mrs. Bush. Uh, I guess for some context, could I, could I could I get some context on these on these statements? Are these uh, statements from like court proceedings? Are they legal documents, or is this just a conversation you had with a person? 
Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, uh, both. So these declarations that have been provided to you were actually taken by an attorney. It was an independent interview that um, I personally did not have anything to do with. However, our team was able to sit down based off this declaration and interview each of these workers. All of them were employed by Maricopa County Elections Department. Uh, two of them worked in both managerial level and curing, and one of them was a first level employee of Maricopa County for multiple election cycles. Uh, could you sort of explain it in plain language, 20 words or less, what it means of what these affidavits are stating for the rest of us untrained in these matters? Absolutely. So what these affidavits are basically stating is they're confirming the fact that there is no way possible that the county could adequately review the number of ballots that they claim to review in the time provided. It also indicates that there is a, a um, intentional uh, desire to have the vote count, so therefore uh, the system is set up to lean towards trying to uh, pass a ballot through at all costs, even if that doesn't necessarily mean that the ballot is legitimate. Madam Chair, to this point, is, uh, is there like an attorney that signed off on this? Or, I mean, are we, are we missing, I feel like we're missing a lot of context. I mean, without any kind of like, I mean, even if, it, uh, if they were, what, what do, you, do you? Signed off on what? Notar notarized. Notarized, right? I mean, otherwise these are just statements that you're just presenting to us, right? Madam Chair and Senator, these are actually declarations made under perjury and penalty, and they were taken by, approved by, signed off by the employee themselves, but it was done under the supervision of an attorney, Attorney Kerr Olson, who interviewed these particular employees in relation to legal cause. Thank you. Proceed. So finally, uh, the last thing I want to touch on, on the signature verification, is that we provided our data to a qualified analyst, Dr. Walter Dougherty. He is a senior lecturer emeritus in the Department of Computer Sciences and Engineering at Texas A&M, and a consultant for multiple national and international organizations, including maintaining government contracts with departments such as the Department of Texas Agriculture, to uh, the U.S. Border and Customs. He took the declarations that we received from these various workers along with all of the analytic data we provided him that we've presented to you today. And after analyzing the review by our team and the declarations of those verification workers, he determined with what he believes to be 99.999% confidence level that there were approximately 290,644 failed signatures that would have been introduced into the 2022 election because we failed to repair the broken system. That is uh, all listed on Exhibit 4 by the declaration of Dr. Walter Dougherty. And he will walk through the scientific math that he used uh, that is within industry standard. Okay, before uh, I approve uh, Dr. Doherty to uh, augment your remarks, I want to confirm for the record uh, that what you have stated is I would like you to swear uh, that uh, you've stated everything true to the best of your knowledge and that you uh, stand by that as a legal truth. Am I saying it right? under penalty and perjury. And Gunny here was making sure I covered my bases here. So uh, raise your right hand and swear for me, please. Madam Chair and Senators, I swear that all that I'm saying is to the, to the absolute truth, to the best of my ability and understanding. Okay, very Ma well. Madam Chair, to that point, this is not a court of law, so. What was the point of that, yeah. The point of that is to make absolutely sure in the record that uh, we have covered all bases. And uh, that's my prerogative as the chair. Uh, yeah, are we done? Can I ask, Madam Chair, may I ask more questions or are you dismissing her? I have uh, an augmented uh, subject matter expert who I would like to call to the microphone, Dr. Doherty. Madam Chair. Dr. Doherty, if you would state your name and that uh, you swear that you are conveying the truth, whole truth, and nothing but the truth. My name is Walter Doherty, and I swear that what I'm about to present is true to the best of my knowledge and ability. 
Thank you, sir. Proceed. And if you would, for our uh, colleagues here, uh, explain your role and uh, a quick uh, reference to your background as it pertains to your role. Uh, yes. Could I ask you to switch the jump drive to mine? Um, my education is at Oklahoma Christian University and at Harvard where I received master's and doctor's degrees. I taught computer science and engineering for 37 years. The last 32 years of that was at Texas A&M University. And I've also been a consultant to major national and international corporations and government agencies, including classified work. I have used the knowledge and experience that I have in analyzing election data beginning with the 2020 election since at bottom voting machines are computers and election data is math. So math and computers are my specialties and that's what I have done with data from Arizona elections both in 2020 and 2022 to the follow up directly with what uh, Ms. Bush has presented. They took the proportion of signature mismatches in 2020 and said if the same proportion or percent of mismatches had occurred in 2022, how much would it be? So you take that percentage and then multiply it by the number of votes in 2022 and say how much would it be? The next question is how sure are you of that number? How accurate is it? So when we talk about projections, and this is a projection using 2020 data to project to the proportion of mismatches in 2022, the way you assign a statistical limit is by putting bounds on it. So to use a familiar example, if you see a weather report that there's a hurricane 100 miles north of Bermuda that's headed straight for Miami, you know exactly where the hurricane is now. So you're 100% certain of its position. But you are only 95% sure of where it will be 24 hours from now. And so you always see on the weather map that it gets wider. So after one day, it will be somewhere between here and here. After two days, it will be somewhere between here and here. And after a week, it will be somewhere between Florida and Maine. So we're adjusting the percentage by the bounds on the statistical limits. So what I did was to take the proportion of mismatch signatures in 2020 projected to 2022 that you've just heard presented in that report and then apply statistical limits. So I believe you have a copy of my declaration. This is the last page, Exhibit D, and I'm going to put up uh, on, as a slide a portion of that because the slide is too wide to fit on the projector screen. Okay, good. The uh, top level uh, of, of the graph, so there are two halves to this chart or spreadsheet. So the top half of the chart is the egregiously mismatched signatures. So this is where the voter registration card said John Smith and the signature said Susie Jones. Or there was a legible signature on one and a dashed line on the other. So a, ma a mismatch that they deemed or termed egregious is one that couldn't possibly match under any imaginable scenario. So that's the top half. The bottom half of the graph deals with the mismatched signatures which were deemed mismatched under the standards of the Secretary of State. And so that is uh, obviously a different standard. And so what you will see on the last page, in the middle of the page, you'll see that the egregious mismatch signatures had 0.0996 proportion, that is 9.96% mismatch, and the standard 
Secretary of State standard mismatched was 12.7%. So nine, it's roughly 10% and 12%. Now, if you project that to the 2022 election, which is the right half of the last page here, and that is the right half which is on the screen, you'll see in each of these halves, the top and the bottom half, a row of five numbers. So the top row, which is row three, I will attempt to highlight and can't do it. Okay. So uh, the first one is a 95% level. So with 95% probability, we can say that the projection to 2022 for the, this number of ballot envelopes should be between 187,000 and 191,000. The row below it is with a 99% probability. It says that it would be between 186,000 and 192,000. You'll notice that the bounds are getting wider. So you say, I'm 95% sure it's between here and here, and I'm 99% sure it's between here and here. And then again, the third line, 99.9, 99.99, 99.999, and I didn't see any point in going beyond that. So we've got to this level of certainty to say that the number, uh, again, the, t the top half is the egregiously mismatched signatures projected to 2022 would be at least 184,000 uh, of, of the 1.9 million ballot envelopes. And if you also included the early votes, that's the green number on the right, 127,000. The bottom half is the same calculations done using the Secretary of State standards. So again, instead of roughly 10% being mismatched, there's 12.7% being mismatched. So under that scenario, the bottom line, 99.999% confidence that it's greater than 236,763 mismatched signatures on ballot envelopes and greater than 163,458 um, early votes, uh, uh, signature mismatches for those. So with those projections, if you take the smallest of those four numbers, so we're saying look at them with two different levels of strictness as to what constitutes a mismatch. That's the top half and the bottom half. And then look at two categories, the ballot envelopes and the early votes. And then you take the lowest of all of those numbers. That's 127,186. The margin of victory in the governor's race just conducted in Maricopa County was 17,117 votes. So that means the projection for mismatched signatures in 2022 with 99.999% probability is that they were more than seven times the margin of victory mismatched signatures. So that is the calculation that I did to extend the information that has been presented by Ms. Bush. Dr. Doherty, question. Uh, were there other uh, types of failures in uh, Maricopa County in 2022 uh, besides the mismatched signatures? Yes, there were. And that is the remainder of my declaration. So what I've just described is the fourth part and the last page of Exhibit D. But if you will go to um, page three, I'd like to give a, a brief explanation of how the ballot insertion errors attributed to a 19-inch image could have occurred. Okay, now we're talking about something different than signature verification. That's right. We're I'm talking talk about additional system failures, okay. errors, and inconsistencies. Okay, so the two issues this overall briefing uh, is about is number one, signature verification under the election mechanics rubric, and number two, the 
tabulation machines uh, concerned. Go ahead. Correct. So um, the ballot tabulation uh, insertion errors, as has been described, if a voter filled out their ballot and inserted it and it was rejected by the tabulator, there are some legitimate reasons that can occur. Because, for example, the tabulator is programmed not to allow an overvote. So if you vote for two people for a race that only one person you can vote for, or if, let's say, for a city council, you could vote for up to two people and you voted for three, the tabulator catches it immediately and says, this is not valid. Do you want to correct it? And gives the voter a chance to review the ballot. So it, it, so that is a legitimate reason that a tabulator might reject a ballot. If a voter inadvertently uh, overvoted on a particular, uh, in a particular case, the voter then has a choice either to correct the ballot or to say, I want to cast it anyway. If they say, I want to cast it anyway, then what happens in the tabulator is that that one race is ignored. So if you voted for two people for governor, then that would be counted as an overvote and not as a vote for either one, but the rest of the ballot would be processed. If the voter chose to make the correction and erase one of the bubbles thoroughly uh, and then insert it, then it should be accepted. So that's a legitimate reason that a ballot could be ejected when it was inserted to the tabulator is that the tabulator detected an overvote. What would not be a legitimate reason would be a misprinted ballot. And that's the 19 inch ballot that is depicted on page three. So it's not obvious if you just glance at it that these two ballots are very different. So if you refer to that picture on page three, this is the back page of a good ballot at the top and an invalid ballot at the bottom. So if you just glance at it, they look very similar. But if you look closely, you will see that on the left and right ends of the top ballot, there's roughly a half inch margin. And on the left and right ends of the bottom ballot, there is a roughly a one inch margin. In other words, the size of the image at the top from the black marks on the left to the black marks on the right has been shrunk by 5% on the bottom image. Madam Chair, on this top, on this, on this uh, subject of the tabulation and the, the, you know, the image, the 19 inch image, but in, the, in, in that case, the, so the tabulator rejected it, but I believe what occurred, and I'm not a Maricopa County resident, so I'm thankfully, I mean, I didn't experience this, but what I, what I believe occurred is those ballots that were rejected by the tabulator then went into a separate box to be later tabulated uh, at their headquarters, right? So it's not, this is, this is an on-site failure, but not a, a miss, you know, a, an ultimately rejected vote. Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Cinderation, um, it was a rejection at the, of the tabulator at the voting center. However, it's an invalid ballot. It would also be rejected if it were put into a tabulator at central count because they have to have the same program. So this bottom ballot could not have been counted by any tabulator because the size doesn't match. So how did, so then what did occur, and, and actually this raises another question, is have we, a lot of serious allegations being raised here. Have have you uh, have you all reached out to Maricopa County to ask uh, what their processes were with with all of these various actions? Uh, Miss Bush, you can approach the mic and uh, answer if you feel more qualified. Madam Madam Chair and Senator, those ballots would then be sent to Central Tabulation, where we would presume that they were duplicated onto a readable ballot and then insert it into the system. Is there a way to know that did get done? There would be no way for us as voters to confirm that that occurred. And when we're dealing with the magnitude we are, that is the level of concern. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Vice Chair. I'll have a bill in a few days that I think will help to address that situation well, but that we've discussed. But, fine, uh, but uh, the, the 
what is germane is what occurred in the past. So to for you to answer me, I'm hearing you say, and answering my colleague, we don't know. Is that correct? Madam Chair, that is correct. So we don't know if a 19-inch ballot, which got rejected innumerable times, ever got counted. What about the proverbial drawer three uh, that we all heard about? Explain that to me. So there were two polling centers, four tabulators all together, that uh, had the commingling Don't issue go away, of the Doc. drawer three. I want to get out of the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's fine. So there were tabulators that were identified as having problems, and when those problems occurred, those ballots were placed in a drawer three. There were a few scenarios of concern with that, and uh, I would like to go back to the presentation and show you those graphs. And okay, is uh, Dr. Doherty done? I, I don't know. I have some more, but I think one of my graphs will address that point. Okay, okay, as long as you two can work that out. Go ahead. Absolutely. Let me... I guess while you're uh, uh, adjusting there, um, my question is um, what caused so many ballots to be rejected uh, by the tabulators as unscannable? If you refer to the picture there on page three, the outline of the ballot is a series of black boxes. So there are black boxes on three of the four corners, large black boxes, and the fourth corner is blank. So if you'll notice, the looking only at the top ballot, on the left-hand side, there is a top left and a bottom left big black box. And on the right, there is a blank and a bottom big black box. And the purpose of the blank is that the ballot can be inserted either direction, either right side up or upside down. And so this tells the scanner which side of the ballot is up. It's the side with the two black boxes is the top of the ballot. Then in between those marks, forming a kind of frame around the ballot is a sequence of very small black boxes. And these small black boxes are timing synchronization marks that identify the row and column for a particular bubble. So when you have a bubble for a race and the scanner reads it, it can't read the, the text beside that bubble. All it can tell is what row and column that bubble is on. And then it looks in the ballot definition file to say what candidate's bubble is at that row and column. So the corner marks are important to determine top and bottom of the ballot and the side marks are important to determine the alignment of where the bubble is and which candidate or measure uh, that that should be counted for. Senator Bennett. Madam Chair, Mr. Doherty, my recollection of the explanations given by Maricopa County for the reason that so many ballots were unreadable by the tabulators is that the printers were set incorrectly and that they were too lightly printed, for lack of a better term. Would you agree that um, the tabulation machines can be set um, so that if a ballot is printed too lightly, that it would reject that ballot as well? Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, that's exactly right, and okay. that's the next graph I'm going okay. to show. All right. So the, the first reason that ballots are rejected is because the timing marks are incorrect. They're too small, so they're, they've been shrunk by 5%. So it's not clear, it's not obvious to the naked eye that the little black boxes around the edge on the top are 5% larger than the little black boxes around the the edge at the bottom but the computer program is extremely precise and it requires two things it requires all of those timing marks to be exactly the right size and to be perfectly black so if either one of those criteria fails then the software says reject the ballot so the ballot will be rejected if the timing marks are too small as they are in the case of the bottom ballot or if you will turn the page
to the next picture on page five, you'll notice a blotchy printing. So the blotchy printing here would occur when the printer was not set for a high enough fuser temperature. So basically, there's a setting on the printer that says how thick is the material you're going to print. Because if you're printing on 20 pound bond paper, or you're printing an envelope, or you're printing a ballot, which the manufacturer says has to be 80 pound or 100 pound paper, then you need a higher temperature setting on the fuser in order to basically melt the little dots of toner in, into the paper. And if the temperature isn't high enough, then they don't stick and they basically flake off. And that's what gives you this blotchy appearance that you can see in the top bar. The settings on those printers, obviously, since the manufacturer says that the ballot paper has to be 80 or 100 pound paper, should have been set on heavy. So I don't remember the exact words, but it's basically light, medium, and heavy is what kind of document are you wanting to print on. They should have been set on heavy. A number of the printers were not. And so that was one of the remedies that the technicians uh, tried, in some cases successfully, in some cases not, uh, at the various voting centers. So yes, the printers should have been set for heavy media. They were not always set that way. And when they were not, the blotchy printing meant that those timing marks weren't perfectly black. And so if the computer software saw any white specks in that black box, it says, this is not a good timing mark. It's not a valid ballot. Eject it. Madam Chair. Senator Bennett. Um, it's my recollection that in response to those situations, the county said that these ballots were taken to central count where the machines were set up to accept a lighter print or a blotchier. Um, and that, would you agree that the central count machines or other types of machines different than the ones in the voting centers uh, can be set to accept a lighter print? No, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, and Senator Bennett, uh, no, I would not agree with that statement because the same ballot definition uh, file has to be used. So the central count did not say it's okay to have a 19-inch image. Okay. It, it did well, not. I'm not talking that. about the size of the image. I'm talking about the darkness of the print. Um, during the six years I was Secretary of State, um, it was always described to me, and maybe this was in layman terms because I'm not a uh, computer specialist or whatever, but it was always described to me that when ballots are laid out, uh, as you noted with the timing marks, um, the system is designed to basically say that so many inches down and so many inches in, or in this case it's probably more likely stated that if I come down 13 timing marks and go in five timing marks, if I find so many pixels of blackness there, I record a vote for Smith. If I come down 19 timing marks and in five, that's a vote for Garcia. Um, but it was always described to me that those systems also had a, an element of how many pixels of blackness they see in that area. Some people fill in the oval, and it's black almost to the bleeding through on the other side. Other people <laughs> don't. And so I've, I've always been under the understanding from the descriptions given by manufacturers or proprietors of election management software and systems that um, there's an aspect to pixels of blackness in whatever area the machine is looking for. Is that different from your understanding that it either finds a fully black mark and accepts it as a vote or anything less than 100% black it doesn't because it's been my understanding that you know some people get the whole oval marked and some people don't. But they get enough of it marked that it accepts a vote in that area. 
Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Bennett, now I understand the, the point of your question. And th we're talking about two different types of marks. So the timing marks around the border have to be 100% black. They cannot be blotchy. There is no adjustment to say if it's 50% black counted as a timing mark because then it can't be sure where the bubble is. Okay. So the timing marks have to be 100% black. They have to be the, the full size. They can't be short or narrow. They can't be shrunk. They have to be the perfect size and they have to be perfectly black, the timing marks. The bubbles where the voter fills in, now there is a configuration setting for the threshold of blackness to count it as a vote or not. Because what will happen, as you well know from your long experiences, uh, Secretary of State and participating in, in many other uh, election related activities, is that some voters will put their pin down on one dot and then say, oh no, I want to vote for the other person. Right. Yeah. And so there'll be a big black dot for the second candidate and a small black dot for the first candidate. The standard configuration for these tabulators is between 14 and 35 percent. So if it's less than 14 percent black to end bubble, it says that's a stray mark, just ignore it. If it's more than 35 percent filled in, then it says that's the person that they intended to vote for or the yes or no on the, the water bond proposition or okay. whatever. So the timing marks have to be perfectly black or it can't be scanned. But, the, that the, are, but there is a range in the bubble areas. In the bubble area, there is a Where it's a programmable range. thing Absolutely. as to when to count a mark and when not to. And what typically happens, uh, this is a technical term in election processing, adjudication. So adjudication has a common meaning of something was officially decided, that uh, it was adjudicated right. that this person won the 100-meter race or, or whatever. But in election terms, adjudication means that the voter's intent has been determined. So when the tabulator scans a ballot and it sees one bubble that's less than 14% blacked in and the other candidate is more than 35% blacked in, it says, I am sure of this voter's intent, count one vote for the second candidate. Right. If it sees two bubbles that are 50% filled in, the machine says, I don't know who they voted for or if this is an overvote, and ask for a human to review it. And then the human... Or in Arizona, we have two humans. They have to be from different parties. Exactly. We'll manually adjudicate. So you have the, the automatic adjudication for the unambiguous cases. Right where the voter's intent is clear. And in the case of bubbles, the standard setting on these tabulators is 14 and, and 35 percent. That can be adjusted, and this is probably what uh, you were uh, told about uh, scanning on a different scanner. Dr. Doherty, question pursuant to this uh, exchange. I'm hearing you say the timing marks have to be sufficiently black, but they also have to be in the right position, correct? They have to be the right size, the right position, and perfectly black. Otherwise, the software says this could be a Xerox ballot. It's, it's, it doesn't look like a valid ballot, and that's why it will reject it. We will not process any further. It will produce an error message. I think I gave one of those error messages in, quoted one of the error messages. And while you're looking, so forward. irrespective of what uh, – computer down at central wherever vis-a-vis -vis one out in a outlying location they're calibrated the same correct correct to that point go ahead yeah. uh, is the percentage that determines whether it's stray versus a potential vote does that who's is that in election law is that in election rule book or is that up to each recorder to decide uh, madam chair senator Kavanaugh my understanding is that this is the vendor's recommended settings. Uh, so if I continue, vendor recommended, so is it the recorder that determines what they want to use or? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Kevin, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair yes, Senator Kavanaugh. Um, in Arizona, the 15 counties have chosen to use one of three vendors 
Um, Maricopa County uses Dominion. Yavapai County uses Unison. And the other 13 counties use ES and S. But the, um, the settings or the ranges of the 14 and the 35 uh, is, is unique to, no, I mean, one vendor may have 14 to 35, another one might have 15 to 40, or, I mean, I think those can be varied. Um, so it's vendor's choice. So it's, it's vendor specific as to what they say their specifications are. Uh, and then the counties get to choose which one of, I think there's about seven approved vendors nationwide, and Arizona uses three of them. Okay, but to clarify this whole back and forth, we're talking timing marks and mm -hmm. the reason that the ballot gets rejected and we sort of thank you for your expertise, Senator Bennett, but we got off on uh, the validity of the bubble or not and that's not really germane to what we're talking about. So let's stay on track if we may. Um, I'll be clear, there's nowhere in state law that, or the election procedures manual that specifies the 15 or 35 percent numbers. Uh, we specify that the counties can only use equipment that's been certified at the federal through the federal level and, and through a similar state level uh, but otherwise it's the the vendors prerogative to design their system to be a little bit different than somebody else's system okay Madam Chair. let's stay on track go ahead uh, if Madam you look on page four back up one page uh, in paragraph 13 here are some error messages that occur when either the image was shrunk to 19 inches or the heat setting was too low and there was blotchy printing. So here are the, the, uh, the four error messages. Left edge marker number 39 not found. So it's scanning down the left edge and the first 38 markers were the right size and the right blackness, but the 39th one wasn't. And at that point it says, this is a bad ballot. Next message, determine vertical edge markers failed. If one of those marks is wrong, the whole ballot is wrong. Third mayor message, ballot misread. So that says this is not a good ballot. And finally, ballot returned to a voter since the ballot is unscannable. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, so these problems aside, if a ballot is rejected by the machine, it will ultimately go to human reviewers to be adjudicated and then counted, right? So I, I'm no. I'm kind of failing to see the should import. Be. Should yeah, it should, should be, be, but it should then. And you should then be able to, tr you know, if you if you as a voter experienced this problem with the tabulator rejecting your ballot, you can go online yourself at Arizona.vote and check that your vote counted. So, uh, you know, these these machine. These machine issues are, are are perhaps embarrassing for the for the um, you know the the fact that they occurred and I'm sure they will be addressed uh, very quickly, but I, I you know it does seem to be that you know when we talk about the number of rejected ballots and we know that they have to be placed in a separate a separate tray a separate bin to for later later you know tabulation or human adjudication it is verifiable it's it's. It's a little bit speculative to, to leave it there and say, well, we don't know whatever happened to those votes. Go ahead and comment, please. Sure. Madam Chair, Senator, in regards to even what Senator Bennett had stated, the EAC helps to determine which equipment should be used and why it should be used and to set those standards. I think we can all agree on that. So the issue we're having is more than just a few malfunctions and so but, what I'm going to walk let's, you through uh, stand by mm -hmm. address if you would her question though is there a trackable verifiable way to know if the vote eventually got counted sure madam chair senator no there is not a ballot has no identifiable information on it and there is absolutely zero way for them to indicate when a ballot is not tabulated on site that that ballot is associated with the voter. They check in at a poll and it indicates that there is a poll book check-in but until that ballot is actually ran through a tabulator there's no way to identify the voter to the ballot and there's no way for a voter to have 100% confidence that their actual ballot counted. Yeah. Point, to that point, Sylvia, did I hear you say 
until the ballot is run through a tabulator, there's no way to identify the voter to that ballot. Is that what you just said? A ballot has no identifying information on it. So all we right. know is that but a voter that checked said, in. Madam Chair, but after that you said, until a ballot is run through a tabulator, there's no way to identify a specific ballot to a specific voter. I don't think you used the word specific, but you indicated to identify a, a ballot to a voter. So, Madam Chair, Senator, I may have misspoken how I said that, but let's just use a scenario of 20 voters check in at a polling location. Correct. We know those 20 voters checked in, but until those 20 ballots are actually counted, we do not know that all 20 voters' ballots oh, okay. counted. Correct, but we don't know which of the 20 necessarily went which with each voter. Um, Is that correct? That is correct. The ballots are anonymous. There is no identifying markers, and there's really no way to tell whether your vote counted. Unless you go well, online and look at the website was my colleague's well, question. But, no, no. but to your point, if 20 people checked in at a polling location, voting center, whatever you want to call them, and that produced 20 ballots that were counted in the system, the system attributes those 20 votes to those 20 people. You don't know which vote for which person, per se, but the system uses that type of correlation, I guess, to say that these 20 people signed in, there were 20 ballots processed, and so we will record on the voting history where you can go to the Secretary of State's office and see if your ballot was counted. Um, it would be a yes for those 20 people. To that point. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, the Senator, if I could, if I could address that, um, we have analyzed the CVR files, the poll books, and the slog files, which is the system log files, which is part of what we're going to go over very briefly. And there is always a discrepancy between the poll books and the number of ballots counted for various reasons. The county has even well documented and indicated that a poll book check-in does not necessarily mean a ballot cast. We had uh, one of my very close friends and somebody who works in our organization, her husband went in, checked in at the poll book, cast a ballot, but then later the county notified him that his ballot was not showing as tabulated. So with all due respect, the, the, the numbers, the math is not always that clean to have 20 check-ins, 20 ballots, 20 tabulations. So there's always a, a significant or small portion of, of um, imperfectness that occurs in our elections that will not allow for that kind of perfect balancing. Just to, to that, that point, point. Well, we're so when a person went there and because of this printer problem, the ballot didn't go through and they were told, put it in door number three and they didn't want to do that. And instead they said, I'll go to a different polling place. And they went to the different polling place. And when they went there and tried to check in, they were told that you already voted at the first polling place. Then they would have walked away not being able to vote. And I assume there's no record of how many people we're in that situation. Madam Chair, Senator Kavanaugh, you're absolutely correct. And that, that was to my point. A um, poll book check-in is how we determine or log that somebody voted. But it doesn't always mean that somebody voted. It's really just that very first step of we're allowing you to vote and we're going to issue you a ballot. OK, let's uh, get back on track. Yeah. Um, I got a. Uh, text from someone out in uh, LD7 land who says they cannot hear us unless we speak right into the mic. So colleagues, especially my marine friend over here, we need to speak right into the mic. I'm so timid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess my question to either one of you subject matter experts is uh, how widespread across the county was this phenomenon madam chair i'd like to show you a, just a couple of brief slides oh, to hopefully okay. put that in perspective thank you so this first slide here is more just exemplary like it's an example of what i'm about to show you okay there are two blue dots on this graph each representing a different tabulator there are typically two tabulators in a polling center 
So in this scenario, they're connected by a line because they're in the same polling center. So we have tabulator A and tabulator B. The blue dot size is going to tell us how many errors occurred on that tabulator, how many ballot misfeeds occurred on that tabulator. The left axis will show you the percentage of errors and the bottom horizontal axis is going to represent the polling centers. So in this scenario, you have one polling center and you have two tabulators. Tabulator A had a misfeed amount of approximately 2,000. Tabulator B, which is the smaller dot above, is the second tabulator within that polling center. And they had a misread amount of maybe 50 to 100. So if you look at this graph, this represents Maricopa County's 223 polling centers in a perfectly compliant EAC world. EAC standards allow for an error rate of 0 .002 or 1 in 500 misfeeds. That is the EAC standard published in the EAC manuals. The size of the dot and the number of ballots is still represented here. That red line you see horizontally at the bottom, that is the line of what would be considered Election Assistance Commission compliant. And this is representative of what we would call an imperfect but good election. This looks great, right? So we've got just a couple of tabulators that are stepping out of key, one of them at about 16% error rate and one at six. Both of them easily rectified, replaced, or maybe just put out of commission. So this is an imperfect but normal election. This is notional. This is not actual, correct? That is correct, Madam Chair. The next slide I'm about to show you is taking the slog files. Which are what system, again? The system log files. These are the files that the tabulators generate that tell you each result of a read. And when so did you get that information? That was provided to us approximately two weeks ago to analyze that along with the unredacted, or I'm sorry, the redacted cast vote records or and that, CVR records. And that's what Senator President Fan requested? These particular items, the uh, system log files and the cast vote records were actually obtained through a public records request. Okay, and before you go to the next slide, what, what is a cast vote record? Cast vote record is the, the system file that's produced by the machine. It essentially breaks down every single ballot by what race it voted for. It's a very long spreadsheet that says we tabulated the first ballot, so tabulation one, and it resulted in this race ahead, this race, this race, and it's, it's just broken down. So it's, it's essentially the report of the election results that come out of the tabulators. Per, per ballot. It's broken down. Every single ballot is assigned a tabulation sequence number, and it shows every single ballot and every single race tabulated from that ballot, every single overvote and undervote. But not the private information of the voter. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the county even redacted the uh, tabulation numbers off of that, so there would be no way that uh, super geek analytic data people could find a way to marry those back together. Okay, so just real quick. I represent four counties that aren't Maricopa County, and I've had my constituents say, hey, Senator, help us get the cast vote records, please, from uh, whatever county they want, and they're still struggling to get that. But I'm to understand this was obtained for Maricopa County? Madam Chair, yes, this was received from Maricopa County as a redacted version, and we have both the um, redacted pre recount CVR files and the post recount CVR files. The cast vote record has always historically been public records information. I think it's only recently with all of the questions of elections that counties are becoming more protective of releasing that data. Uh, so this, what you're going to show us is, is 2022 data? This is 2022 data. Okay. That is correct. So this next slide is the actual Maricopa County elections. So what you will see here is every single tabulator in 230, 223 polling centers. 
Each one of those lines at the bottom represent the name of that polling center, and each of the dots above represent the tabulator. As you can see, not one of the 446 tabulators in Maricopa County were EAC compliant. Every single one of them fell in an error rate much, much higher. Some at average 235 times the Election Assistance Corporation federal regulation. And you can see some tabulators up above failed at a rate as high as 95%, yet they continued to be commissioned and used. When you have a 95% failure rate, why are we feeding 5,000 ballots into a tabulator with that high of a malfunction? Madam President, uh, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. and for that matter, to that point, why is the taxpayers paying for this? Madam Chair, Senator Borelli, I think that's a great question. Proceed. Great question. So the colors on this chart are representative of something, too. Interestingly enough, the county made a decision to zero out all tabulations at particular polling centers on election day and take all of those ballots back to central count to be retabulated. There were 44 of them to be exact. Why would they do that? Madam Chair, I have no idea. I do understand and I will show you in the next slide why some of them were done, but the majority of them um, actually do not seem to have any scientific mathematical reason for doing so. What impact does that have? The impact is the ballots then become sort of commingled as they go to central count and you have major large tabulators there at central count that will then be fed the ballots from these 44 stations nullifying any results in the CVR record of tabulations for those 44 centers which again lends to my point and Senator Bennett's point of the poll books matching the CVR and the cast vote records and knowing those votes counted. When you zero out a tabulator and take those ballots elsewhere, you're increasing probability of errors, mistakes, or ballots potentially not being read at all. To, to so, the, uh, to uh, stand by. So, what you're saying is in those 44. Uh, polling locations where the tabu I'm just trying to understand this where the tabulator machines got zeroed out those ballots which ostensibly would have been counted before the zeroing out then would go be transported and either counted again or not counted explain that to me Madam Chair, yes. So any ballots from a zeroed out tabulator, such as I will show you. Let, let's go to that scenario before okay. I change to the graph. There were two polling centers where the county admitted that the box three ballots accidentally commingled in with the tabulated ballots. That would be a prime example of a reason why we would have to zero that tabulator count the number of ballots present and retabulate everything because it would be the only way the county could be sure that every one of those ballots got counted because once they're commingled we don't know whether they were counted or not counted but that was four tabulators in two polling centers that the county had admitted publicly the reason for the other 42 polling centers is still unknown to that point yeah so Madam Chair, so you've got them all grouped on one side of your table. Did you purposely do that because they were retabulated, or I mean, or, or is that alphabetical in it and by weird chance it got that way, or are these based on the location of the polling places? Sure. As Madam Chair and Senator, this was intentional to show that there doesn't seem to be any scientific or statistical rationale to choose those 42 polling centers. So we grouped them together so you could see the difference in, in the error and misfeed rates between the magenta and the blue or the the zeroed out and the non-zeroed out. Now, as you can tell, there really isn't, right? Visually, when we look at the data, 
uh, it doesn't make sense to us because we we don't know why the county made that decision. So when I move to the next graph, this might make a little more sense. The next graph is actually alphabetized by polling center. So you'll see the blue and the magenta mixed in. The ones you see with the stars are the ones that the county identified as the ones that had printer errors, right? We, we look at these misfeeds and we say, it was mostly due to printer errors, ballots too small, ink not properly adhering to the ballot, and this seems to be the common thread. But when you look at this final graph here, you will see there are many with high tabulation error rates or misfeed rates that were not identified as the county as having a printer issue. So they were either misidentified as not having a printer issue, and they actually did, or our reasons were bigger than just a printer issue. The yellow dots you see represent the four tabulators and two polling centers where the county admitted the commingling of the ballots. Those were the legitimate ballots to be recounted. And the concerning thing about recounting those other 42 is when you look at the cast vote record, those polling centers actually show up as zero. And so all of the ballots from those 42 polling centers are then mixed into the grouping of central count MTEC tabulators. So we won't be able to marry those, the number of ballots from each polling center back to the number of poll book check-ins. Another question if I could. Uh, Madam Chair, you showed two slides. One was a hypothetical okay election with a little screw up, you know, a little typical government leeway we give. Uh, what if you, could you have taken these results and compared the same results for the 2020 election to see I mean, w was this level of screw up also in the 2020 election, or is this something unique to 2022? Which I think is like the really interesting question. Madam Chair, Senator Kavanaugh, that was going to be one of my asks. If we had the data to analyze previous elections, it would be my recommendation that we absolutely do that so that we can determine whether this was a isolated event or something we've yeah. been dealing and with. And Madam Chair, and I would suggest maybe a preliminary step would be to, there's 44 of them, maybe randomly select 10 and see what's going on there. And if all is normal, then you're probably okay. But if those 10 show similar patterns, then that's a real problem. Are those cast vote records for 2020 available? We, we absolutely have access to the 2020 cast vote records. We would need access to the system log files, which I would have to check with the county to see if they're available to us. Okay. So the final thing I want to point out above all is number one, not one of the tabulators fell within the federally regulated EAC standard. And number two, there seemed to be no rhyme or reason as to which tabulator they used and which tabulators they zeroed. There were a total overall feed of 464,926 ballots collectively into these tabulators. Now that is not individual voters, so I wanna be clear. Some voters attempted multiple times. So this is feeds we're talking about, not voters. But out of 464,000, 926 feeds, 217,305 failed, which means we had nearly a 50% ballot read failure rate. On what segment of time? The entire day of election, election. for the 2022 midterms. Uh, Senator Kavanaugh. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is Maricopa County. So this is all Dominion machines? Madam Chair, Senator Kavanaugh, that is correct. This, we have only done this analyzation okay. in Maricopa County at this point. We are working to gather the data yeah. for other counties. Uh, yeah, and that's my second point. I, I'd be really interested to see what the error rates are for other counties with different machines. Well, I voted in Coconino County in 18 minutes, and my <laughs> ballot went in and got... Oh, no, I dropped it in a box. Never mind. <laughs> We're a little rudimentary up there. Okay. 
So before we open a question, just in conclusion, I would like to ask this body today to really take this situation seriously and ask yourselves if we as citizens, at least the citizens of Maricopa County, can afford to continue using equipment with a 235 times the federal standard of failure rate and whether or not that in any way will instill or build confidence into an already broken election system. I have uh, all of the exhibits that were provided to you today along with a copy of the presentation on this website that I have posted if anybody needs to reference it or would like to share it with your colleagues. Um, and if you have any questions for myself or our data analytics team, I'll be happy to answer those. And I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. I have two questions. Dr. Doherty, do you have anything to add? Um, y yes, Madam Chair. The cast vote records uh, are an important check. They're not the only check. And I believe one senator said he was from Yavapai County. I believe that county has still not uh, responded to public records request for the cast vote record there. So you might want to follow up on that with, uh, uh, with your county. Um, the other point that I think is uh, relevant to make is that these ballot uh, insertion errors where the ballot was rejected, uh, as was pointed out, it might have been four times per ballot since there are four ways you can put the ballot in, front, back, top, top, bottom. But even dividing the number by four, it's still far in excess of the federal standard that say there should be no more than one out of 500 misfeeds and we're seeing one out of five when it's 20 percent so that's a hundred times and some of them were even worse than that um, the other thing that i would mention is that the problems of the insertion errors were a large and continuous problem all during election day so it has been reported that this was a small minor problem at just a few voting centers and it was quickly remedied by having the technicians adjust the printer settings. The system log files show a very different picture. What the system log files show when we added them up in 30 minute intervals that in 30, every 30 minutes across the county from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m there were at least 7,000 ballot insertion errors. Sometimes it was over 8,000. And so if you're plotting it, it starts at zero at 5 a.m., comes up to 7,000 at, uh, let's Seven see. To what, let me see what Six page that graph is on so I don't have to uh, wave my hands and draw it. Uh, this is on page 9. So if you look at the graph on page 9, what it shows that is across the county there were over 7,000 ballot insertion failures in almost every single 30-minute period for the entirety of Election Day, starting at 7 a.m. and continuing to 8 p.m., with a smaller number of failures prior to 7 a.m. and after 8 p.m. This was thus an enormous and continuous problem which did not get better overall during election day, despite numerous technicians making adjustments throughout the day. Quick to the point question. Uh, since some of these errors are, are due to somebody putting the ballot in the wrong way, and you would assume that, well, yeah. Uh, excuse me, okay. no sir, it will accept it. In, insert it any direction. Okay. So in, in any but way... But if it's a 19-inch ballot, okay. it won't accept right, it in so, any direction. But okay. you might try four times, hoping it would. Okay, so this, this, these errors can't be explained by the person putting the ballot in the wrong way. Correct. Uh, okay, that makes it even more serious. Yes. Then. So the, the, the scanner actually has two read heads to read the front and the back. But by looking at the position of which corner is blank, it can tell which is top and which is bottom and which is front and which is back. Madam Chair, so top and bottom either way, is it the same in terms uh, of so both either, either side and either direction will all work? That's, that's correct. Okay. So the software will flip the image before it looks for the XY coordinates of the bubble. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, one more question, Ms. Bush, if you'd step forward. Uh, you had, uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, very helpful. Uh, Ms. Bush, would you, you spoke to your concerns vis-a-vis -vis the tabulator machines overarchingly to us, the Senate. I would like your expert uh, sort of overarching input um, with regard to the signature verification piece. Yes, Madam Chair. So in conclusion, what we have determined is that the signature verification process in itself and how it's been built is a complete systemic failure. And that continuing to utilize this process with no immediate legislative intervention leaves our entire election system highly vulnerable to fraud and additional problems. Understood. Okay. Um, we're going to adjourn. Yes. Recess. No, uh, recess, I mean. Okay, give me a break. Uh, Senator Chair. Mendez, go ahead. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mrs. Bush, were any of the issues presented today brought up to any of the counties, and did they have a chance to respond? Sure. Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, yes. I have, over the course of the last couple years, made multiple attempts to share my concerns with county workers in the elections department and with leadership in the county. I understand that we are in a climate that is of heightened sense and people are on high alert and protective, but communications with our counties as um, citizens concerned about election integrity has been highly diminished and nearly impossible. Well, but then did the county respond? They did not respond. Right, we're supposed to stop those people from talking, right? Madam Chair? Yeah. To interrupt her while she's going to cap To, the, to that point. Leave. Was this specific presentation presented prior to today to Maricopa County? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Bennett, uh, to answer that, no, it has not. I would be happy to give that presentation sure if like they're it. willing to listen. Yeah, I just, okay. What did you answer? How did you answer yes to my question and then no to his question? He asked uh, if come, the particular the presentation That's has been provided. You asked if this I've contacted the county to provide information of our findings. That's two different questions. I asked if this presentation was, no worries. Madam Chair, uh, Mrs. Bush, may I ask about this group, We the People? Is, 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 this is new to me, I, so I, I have no uh, background for this group. Uh, so to justify you know, why you're standing in front of us, I mean, is, when was this group created? Does this group have any kind of like political affiliation? Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, our group is a public oversight and transparency organization. We consider ourselves nonpartisan as we have pointed out flaws in both the systems and in our political elected on both the Republican and the Democrat side. We actually formed as an official organization in December of 2020, but we have been actively working in investigation, data analytics, and other areas since 2014. We have a qualified and trained team of investigators from law enforcement backgrounds all the way to data analytic teams and people that are highly skilled in computer sciences and data analyzation, and we've been doing this work for about 10 years at a level of citizen oversight. And Madam Chair, Mrs. Bush, so, so you're not like a registered lobbyist or anything like that? Madam Chair, no. Senator Mendez, no, we are not a lobbying organization. Madam Chair and Mrs. Bush, so do you, beyond this endeavor, were you politically involved before? Like, did you run for office or? Madam Chair, Senator Mendez, you mean myself personally? Yeah. I have never ran for a public office. I do serve in my current political party, and that is completely separate and aside from this organization and my work here. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, Ms. Bush, um, so with your organization, are you, are you registered to vote in a nonpartisan manner the way that elections um, staffers would be, or is it just that you consider yourself nonpartisan? Madam Chair, Senator Hernandez, with all due respect, most election workers are very partisanly registered, and there is no requirement for them to not register by their political belief system, all the way from the recorder down to temporary employees. So I am a registered partisan in my personal life, as um, most individuals are in the state of Arizona. The, the organization, though. Sorry, Madam Chair. Yes. Ms. Bush, the organization. Sure. So the organization has no attachment or connection or partnership with 
either political party whatsoever. Uh, we are an independent organization that does not, we're not sanctioned by or operate with any political party.